Hi, thank you very much for having me to speak to you today. I wanted to talk to you about what it's like uh, going from dying with dementia to living positively with it. My name is Kate Swaffer. I live in Australia, in Adelaide, Australia. Um, I am the chair, CEO, and one of eight co-founders of Dementia Alliance International, which is a global organisation specifically for people with dementia. We provide peer-to-peer -peer support, online cafes, uh, educational webinars, uh, and many other free services. As you can see by my bio, I do a lot of other things as well, uh, and uh, I'm delighted to be, again, delighted to be with you today. I just uh, thought that I would start with a global overview of dementia. There are an estimated 52 million people currently living with dementia. Um, globally, this is expected to rise to more than 130 million people by 2056. There's a currently a new diagnosis globally every 3.2 seconds, and there are more than 130 types or causes of dementia. Dementia is, which many people don't know or don't realise, it's a terminal illness. It's also a progressive and chronic one. And many people with dementia that I know have lived for more than 20 years with dementia. Um, and that's happening more and more often as people are diagnosed much earlier in the disease process. There is no cure and there are no disease modifying drugs yet for dementia although there are some treatments for some types of Alzheimer's disease, although at best only um, they may relieve or uh, reduce the symptoms for up to two years. We need a human rights approach to dementia and dementia as a disability and also a human rights approach to ageing. Um, it's important to remember that dementia affects more than memory and does not discriminate by age. Membership of Dementia Alliance International, for example, ranges from the age of our youngest member was diagnosed when he was 18 years old and our oldest members are in their 90s, um, some living in nursing homes and some living in the community. Uh, generally around the world, research funding for dementia is still insufficient. Um, I do believe that in America, a significant amount of uh, research funding has been raised the last few years. So we're slowly uh, encouraging governments uh, and others to invest in dementia research funding. But we do need more research for reversing dementia or slowing the progression of it. So just a little bit of an explanation of dementia. Many people think dementia itself is the disease. In fact, dementia is just an umbrella term for a collection or group of symptoms uh, caused by various disorders um, affecting the brain. It's not one specific disease, just like the word fruit, um, that's an umbrella term for a whole range of different fruits. Um, again, there are subcategories underneath the different types of dementia. Uh, and for example, Alzheimer's disease has a number of different types of Alzheimer's disease. Um, in the same way that there are a lot of different types of apples. And again, I just want to reiterate that dementia is not only about memory loss or confusion. I think, unfortunately, a lot of the um, uh, things called like a memory walk, a memory clinic, a memory cafe, they seem to reinforce in civil society that dementia is only memory loss. And as you can see by the which area of the brain, um, which is what defines which disabilities or which symptoms a person with dementia will have. So for me, I definitely didn't expect to be diagnosed with dementia at age 49. I um, was seeing a neurologist for something else and I started to have symptoms which I had no idea was, were going to be um, dementia, caused by dementia. Um, I was starting to spell, not be able to spell simple words like that. I was seeing colour sets back to front, um, red and green back to front, making it rather dangerous driving. Um, seeing other things, not knowing how to, uh, what the definition of a word was, think, words that I'd been using for years. Um, so I'd worked in a um, aged care and dementia unit in my first year uh, nursing after my training and um, I really did have no idea that these types of symptoms would ever equate to a dementia. So even healthcare professionals um, are not very well educated in terms of 
uh, what dementia is and all of the different types of dementia. So when I was diagnosed, I was advised by everybody around me. It wasn't actually my doctor. Mostly the doctors do the diagnosing. Um, and then you hopefully get referred to some services for support. And all of the services, uh, service providers that I saw really advised me to, to go home, to give up work, to get my end of life affairs in order, to give up study. I was a tertiary, middle-aged tertiary student at the time and to get acquainted with aged care. And in fact, I was advised age 50 to start attending daycare a day a month to get used to it. And dementia really is the only illness I know of where people are told to go home and prepare to die and not supported in any way to fight for our lives. So the cost of this prescribed disengagement is a term which I trademarked in about 2014. Um, the cost of it is uh, its sense of hopelessness for everyone, for those of us diagnosed and for our families. Um, it can lead to the person with dementia uh, becoming or assuming uh, the role of a victim and that further disables and disempowers us. Um, it often promotes learned helplessness in those diagnosed and most care partners or in some countries caregivers or carers um, is what you call them. Um, but care partners are told to take over and they therefore assume all of the power and control, which is unhealthy. Unfortunately, once you're diagnosed with dementia, most people only see the missing bits. They see the deficits. They focus on the things we can't do. So what people forget once a person's diagnosed with dementia um, is that we have a past we have a present and we actually still have a future. So I've done many things in my life. I grew up on a farm. I've been an operating theatre nurse. I've also worked in aged and dementia care. Um, I'm married. I uh, used to do volunteering for The Big Issue in South Australia. I've got two amazing sons. I've done degrees post-diagnosis uh, and I've become an activist for people with dementia. So I've, I have a past and I have a present and I still have a future. I'm definitely not fading away. I am changing, but I'm changing no more now perhaps than I was before, just differently. You're changing as well. Everyone changes every day. So there's been a significant impact of having dementia on my family, particularly in the early days when we all lost that sense of hope when we were told there was nothing that could be done, that I should get my end of life affairs in order sooner rather than later. Uh, my youngest son was 16 when I was diagnosed and, and uh, I, he said to me, but mum, isn't that a funny old person's disease? And I guess even as a nurse, I thought it was mostly an older person's disease. And yet about seven to 10% of people around the world are diagnosed with dementia under the age of 65, which is known as younger onset dementia. Um, some years ago now, I found my husband sitting on the stairs at home with his head in his hands. And when I asked him what was wrong, he said, I know I'm losing you and I'm afraid of what the future holds. My mother once said she felt an anger about me having dementia, an anger that she'd never felt before and that it didn't really go away. And I, having, uh, having two sons, I can't actually imagine how traumatic it would be if one of my sons came ho home and told me that they had dementia and that I might be finding them a nursing home or having to help them with daily activities such as dressing in the later stages of dementia. So I think there are two cohorts of people that really miss out on receiving appropriate levels of care and that's the older parents of someone with younger onset dementia and the children of younger of people with younger onset dementia they're a really important group that seem to be missing out and and i think that my parents felt the stigma far more than i'd ever have so one of the things that happened when my when i was first diagnosed is everybody started calling my husband a carer and after a few years um, he said to me one day, I really hate being called a carer. He said, I cared for you long before you had dementia. And to keep calling me, to call me a carer now, 
it strips him of all of his roles, just like dementia stripped me of all of my roles. People forgot that I was a mother, that I'd been a nurse, that I was a sister or a daughter or a wife. But assigning the name carer or caregiver to a partner or someone in the family strips them of all of their roles. And my husband said, I'm, I'm still your husband and friend and a father to our children. So um, I don't like being called a carer. And in about 2012, I came up with the name Bub, and that stands for backup brain. Um, and in the same way that we back up our computers, those of us who use computers, the only time you go to the backup is when the computer crashes or something's going wrong with the IT. So in the same way that um, the backup brain works, my husband only comes to support me if it's dangerous. The rest of the time, he waits for me to ask for help. So it helped uh, um, us to uh, change the dynamics that dementia can bring in where the person with dementia is told to give up, the person without dementia is told to take over. So there's this huge imbalance of, of power and inequality. So it helped us um, get back to a, an equilibrium that was much healthier. So I chose, uh, not initially, but uh, eventually, within a couple of years, I chose that living with not only dying from dementia was a far uh, better option for me. My life before dementia was interesting, busy and very fulfilling. And my life since the diagnosis of dementia, um, since I've chosen to focus on living, it's continued to be interesting, busy and very fulfilling. And there's no reason most people with dementia who were diagnosed early or even middle stages can't live a much higher quality of life than most currently are. So dementia care is caring for people who often do not know they need care. They don't want to be in care. And no wonder they, we, occasionally become angry and upset. I can guarantee that I wouldn't be comfortable with a stranger, and I do have support workers coming into my home, but I wouldn't be uncomfortable with a stranger coming in, taking off my clothes and making me have a shower. I'm pretty sure none of you would feel comfortable with that. So when somebody reacts to something like that, to some kind of care activity that's being done to them, um, no wonder they might become angry and upset. So it's not anything to do with a reaction or it's nothing to do with the pathology of dementia. It's all about a normal human response to something somebody feels unhappy about. I would not like to be locked away in a secure dementia unit. I would see that as being in jail and I would try and get out every single day. So that's not abscondering. That's not wanting to be a wanderer. That's a normal human response to being locked up. So I implore everyone who's in the care sector to change their thinking about how people respond within a care facility or even in home care. So for me, one of the uh, other key factors to help me live more positively with dementia was that my university uh, taught me to see the symptoms of dementia as disabilities. The World Health Organization has said for some years on their website, um, Dementia Fact Sheets, that dementia is a major cause of disability and dependence in older persons. So from my perspective, by not managing dementia symptoms as disabilities, we're all set up to fail and it promotes the loss of hope and it promotes dependence, dependence first on families or friends, then dependence on the health sector and therefore obviously governments. So if people with dementia were provided with a disability assessment and then strategies and supports in the same way that if you had a son with dyslexia going to school or going to university, they would be sent to the disability services to be provided with support to continue living their lives. People with dementia need that same support. For me, I strongly believe there's a systemic and gross underestimation of the capacity of all people diagnosed with dementia, even in the later stages of the disease. 
and I can give a, a an example of that. When I first came to the city and nursed in a aged care facility and dementia unit, and ironically the first dementia unit in Adelaide, um, I was told by the senior staff that Lady X, Mrs X, was mute, meaning she couldn't speak or communicate at all. Um, and I'd spent a lot of time with older people in my life and I really liked this lady. Um, and perhaps because I was told you know, not to waste my time on her, I spent more time with her. And one day in the washroom, and anyone in the audience who's a nurse or healthcare professional will know that it's a really busy job. But um, I was in the washroom with this lady one day and I, it was a busy day and I said to her, do you think you could hurry up and have a wee? And she looked at me and she had a bit of a smile on her face and she said, do you think you could go and have a wee for yourself? And I said to this lady, I knew you were in there. Why won't you speak? She said, why would I speak to people who treat me like I'm stupid? I will only speak to you in a locked washroom or bathroom. And for the rest of the time that I worked there, the only time she spoke to me was in those areas. So I think that was a, an incredibly good example, real life experience for me as a young woman, um, that people with dementia, even in the later stages of the disease, still have a lot of capacity. So we should never underestimate it. So in 1948, the Declaration of Human Rights was adopted and it's meant to protect everyone. That obviously includes people with dementia. And yet 67 years later, the OECD report addressing dementia, the OECD response, concluded that people with dementia receive the worst care of any disease in the developed world. Now this to me, I, I live in a rich country, Australia, and uh, most of you here today um, probably live in America or Canada. Um, rich countries, um, developed countries, that's a pretty sobering thought to know that people with dementia are receiving the worst care of any disease than anybody else. Um, Human Rights Watch released a report in, at the World Health Assembly in May 2017, um, and it was a report into the uh, overuse of antipsychotics being used as chemical restraint on people living in nursing homes in America. Uh, it's a very sobering report. I, I strongly recommend you read it and have a look at the documentary, uh, the video. Um, and then last year in Australia, they released a similar report about the overuse of chemical restraint in Australia. Um, so it's an important um, human rights and legal rights are, are really the future for people with dementia and their families. The World Health Organization Global Dementia Action Plan, it's the short name for the Global Action Plan for Public Health Response to Dementia. That was adopted uh, unanimously around the world at the World Health Assembly in May 2017 as well. But people with dementia are still being left behind. We don't have access yet to universal health coverage. We don't yet have access to adequate post-diagnostic support. And we certainly don't have access to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities or the CRPD. If you have a look at all of the articles in the CRPD, you will see that most are being ignored and people with dementia, for, the, for those of us with dementia, we are being denied the rights that every other disabled person has. So we need to think about human rights and also that they're legal rights. Um, I advocate strongly for deinstitutionalization of people with dementia. Um, after all, in the 1950s, NASA um, stopped having coloured ladies' rooms. So why are people with dementia being segregated and institutionalised based on only an illness? I know of no other illness where we lock them away in a separate area to everybody else in aged care or in a hospital. I know of no other illness where we're building villages. So the world's become very excited about building dementia villages to house people with dementia who need assisted living. It may be a stepping stone, but it's not the solution. How many villages are we building for people with AIDS or people with cancer? Uh, I know that we used to have uh, leprosy um, colonies or villages 
but we haven't had them for years. We stopped institutionalising orphans because we knew that they received worse care and were often abused. And yet globally, we've been building institutions for people with dementia and older persons to live in when they need assisted living. So we need the same rights as all other others, as all others with all disabilities, including access to the CRPD and other conventions. We need to stop chemical and all forms of physical restraint. So if you're in care, whether you are looking after a family member with dementia, or whether you are working in the healthcare sector or in the aged care and dementia sector, if you think that the person with dementia is giving you a hard time, please remember, they're not giving you a hard time, they're having a hard time. Living with dementia is a particularly difficult experience for most people. And when you're only told to go home and die and everybody else takes over and does for you and you lose your personal individual agency and your ability to make decisions, people stop talking to you, people stop seeing you as a whole person, people refer to you as a sufferer, as an empty shell. No wonder we act like we're giving you a hard time. We're actually having a really hard time. Life is short. Make sure you're not living as if you're already dead. And that's one of my more recent mottos, is to make sure that um, I live as positively as I possibly can for as long as I can. Thank you so much for having me today and I wish you well with the rest of the conference.